with various mushrooms. Just just edible ones, you know. <laughs> I visit the uh, local mycologist uh, who's an expert, he's one of the world's experts. People from Yale and Cambridge visit him and you pay him five uh, chick frown and they they, they uh, tell you, this one will kill you, this one, 1% 1 of the population have an enzyme and it makes them have bad bread. <laughs> They're that thorough. Uh, and uh, so I like picking mushrooms. But uh, for my sins, uh, nearly eight years ago, I decided to take my lifelong passion uh, uh, for alternative energy uh, and uh, I actually took action and, and went to South Korea and met a whole bunch of scientists there. Uh, uh, who seemed to have some commonality in what they were saying, uh, but the problem was is they were trying to compete against each other, and when someone made enough progress, someone would come in and invest in them, and then everything went quiet. And so it was like lots of people going forward and then stopping, and then because they all wanted to win the Nobel Prize, they wouldn't rec you know replicate each other. And so uh, we put forward a proposal, my, myself and, and four others, uh, like-minded people. Um, to put together a project um, uh, to try and encourage claimants to allow their technology to be openly tested. And uh, the first claimant was an Italian guy called uh, uh, Francesco uh, Cellani. And uh, he was a, a, a very, very affable character. He's a really, really good farmer. Um, but he, he, he had a piece of wire that he treated in a specific way. And on the... Uh, 12, 12 seconds past 12, past 12, on the 12th of the 12th of the 12th California time, we launched our second replication, and two days later in Rome, I was happy to report, we saw 12.5% excess heat. And from that point on, I've been hooked. Um, uh, we were told we hadn't achieved what the claimant achieved, because he achieved 27%. <coughs> and then we found an error in National Instruments' in instrumentation of his apparatus, and then we spent two years negotiating as a, as a start-up, open-source body to come to a correct wording about how to report that they'd, with their instrumentation of his And uh, two years later, we, we found out that basically our excess were very close to each other. So... Um, that, that, were, that was both satisfying and annoying and a, and a bit of a baptism of fire. What we also found is that, and you'll probably find this when someone's telling you what to do, um, that uh, you, someone that sims, sit, thinks that they've told you everything they, you, you, that you need to know in order to replicate something. But because they're skilled, maybe you're a pipe fitter, there's some little trick that you know, you know, that, that, that you don't think... In, everyone else in the room, everyone else should know, right? Because it's so basic and you don't tell them and then they make a mistake and you go, oh yeah, I should have told you that. Well, we had two years of that with Francesco uh, Cellani. And so we, we learned the hard way um, that even with the best will in the world, very important details can be forgotten uh, in these processes. So uh, the lookout really has been for um, technology that is so fault tolerant to not good information. And I think probably uh, where we are uh, with what we saw in, in Japan most recently, uh, it's extremely fault tolerant. Um, it, it's, it's something that anyone with a, with a screwdriver and a, and a bandsaw and so forth, they can, they can make this, this equipment. And, and most of the components are bought, bought off the shelf. And it's just surprising because he thinks he's making something that's never been invented before. And a lot of what it does was already achieved by Yul Brown in the 60s and 70s. So, uh, yeah, or 70s and 80s rather. So, th this is not necessarily a new thing, but ho what I hope to be able to share with you today is some findings uh, with this technology that really seriously support the claims of Yul Brown and give us a technology that will enable safe deployment of normal nuclear fission. For one, so if you if you're looking for a zero carbon emission system, you you want something that's gonna the the, the nuclear capacity in the world is gonna double uh, in in the coming twenty years or something according <laughs> to the uh, International Nuclear Atomic Authority, and uh, the problem is for populations is we've seen Chernobyl, we've seen uh, uh, Fukushima, uh, why why do we want that in our backyard again and with however many tens of reactors in the, in the US about to fail in the coming uh, decades or be decommissioned, what are we going to do with the, the waste stockpiles? Are we ever going to bury it? What are we going to do? 
Um, and so we potentially have a real solution. Uh, and, and when you understand how this works, that it is almost the way that life created all the elements that are in our bodies, uh, and how it stabilizes when things get out of hand, uh, and when you, can, when you can actually connect with what it's doing, um, uh, I think it, we're really at the, at the dawn of a new age. So, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, how do you, how do you get mainline physicists to pay attention? Well, I have a friend, an MIT fraternity brother, who worked at SLAC in the linear Accelerator in California for many years. He's published uh, several books, uh, accessible books on dark matter and things like that, and is still very active uh, publishing in the physics area. But when I've sent him things, he never reads them. He just invokes the, you know, the, the nuclear uh, uh, central uh, uh, knowledge that you, you can't get a proton into a nucleus without a so, so, so the and, Coulomb, and Coulomb, and Coulomb barrier. Coulomb yeah. barrier. Yeah. And, um, yeah, the, uh, he, and I assume he's, he's just, you know, typical of the physics community. Uh, what you're doing is wonderful, but if I replicate it in my garage, nobody cares about what I find. If you've got a million of us, what difference is it unless we uh, apply significant uh, resources and, and brain power some of the best physicists to get grants and, and to explore deeply what's going on here. So the, the, the problem with people not reading papers is absolutely ubiquitous. Uh, people at best read the, the abstract and, and the conclusion uh, in most cases. This was very apparent to me when I was meeting even the scientists that care about this. They weren't reading each other's papers and they were making mistakes that the other people had solved. And they even put it in their papers <coughs> that they had solved it. So it, it was about messaging and communication. And what I found out through communicating through YouTube is, uh, is that when you have monetization on, they actually tell you a lot of uh, uh, metrics. And the most time most people will watch a video for is five and a half minutes. And, and so that is where we're at. So you, you have to slice up your parcels of information in small chunks. Now, you said that like I'm a, like a fire hose, and I can be. It's true. And, yeah, great. and, and actually, sometimes I, I talk to people, and I can, I can watch the point at which they've switched off. <laughs> and it's very, very evident. And I, I know I, I'm like 2% into the story. <laughs> like, it's never going to work. So you, 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 there is a real problem with education. And then there's also this like Agent Smith issue. They've had this indoctrination of the pro Coulomb barrier, this is impossible. We, we sold everything to do with nuclear in the 1930s, and, and no, no one needs to do any research for the subsequent 70 years or whatever. Uh, you know, even even uh, uh, Bill Gates said that when he was talking about his fusion system in, in 2010. He says, for 60 years, no one did nuclear in the West. Well, that's not true of Russia. It's absolutely not true of uh, uh, Japan as well, and it's not true of Italy. I don't know what happened in this country where everyone walked away from nuclear, whether it was a systemic desire to make sure only certain people got the inside track. I don't know. However, the, when you see what I present today, you have to ask yourself, <coughs> what explanation can I give to this other than that somehow the Coulomb barrier has been uh, overcome? Now, um, for me, in, at the beginning of 2017, Having seen so many experiments, seen these genuine researchers that have dedicated decades of their lives and actually got real data, um, it came, you, you had to find a solution. And for me, the solution is, is neutrinos. And somehow you pack those neutrinos into a condensed form. Now, I'm not talking about the neutrinos that come from the sun, right? There's 100 trillion neutrinos per, sec per second going through your fingernail. It doesn't matter whether it's day or night. And that's coming from the sun. But these are not the important ones. The important ones are relic neutrinos. And they are much larger, and they can interact with matter. And in fact, they interact with millions and trillions of atoms simultaneously. Their wave function, because they're literally physically large. What kind of neutrinos? Ultra cold, cold uh, neutrinos. They're, they're all relic neutrinos. So these are, these are neutrinos that, these are neutrinos that are uh, either synthesized uh, or, or, or they come from the background radiation. They, they were there at the birth of the universe, and they flood Earth. 
and in fact they could be responsible for literally every stochastic process. So, uh, and, and this is uh, the subject of, uh, so I have a few props with me. <laughs> So the, the first How do we detect these? You what? How do we detect these? Uh, so uh, actually, it, uh, I'm translating this book at the moment. It, it was published in 2010. And what happened was this guy, Alexander uh, Parkamov, he was working at the neutrino physics labs at the Moscow Aviation Institute uh, on time and space and stuff like that. Uh, and in 1988, he discovered a new type of penetrating radiation uh, that was not the normal types of penetrating radiation. And he set about exploring this. And by 1992, just at the end of the Cold War, he cobbled together with things that he pulled out of a skip, a piece of apparatus, and it's right here in the book. Uh, and I've seen it, it's here. Um, and it's basically a metal dish. You've got a, a couple of uh, sardine cans over here, and uh, uh, bits of wire, there's some, a, a door leg there, and a, and a bit of sawn up table. But do not <coughs> underestimate what this device did. What he has is at the focal point, he has a, a, a beta-emitting isotope, and he has a... a, a, a beta-emitting isotope? Beta. 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 beta, 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 yeah, beta, sorry, yeah. Um, and, and so basically something like strontium-90, uh, that, that, that's one of the, the typical <coughs> ones he, that he would use. And, uh, he has behind that uh, a Geiger Muller tube, and what he found is that just like glass can reflect light, these relic neutrinos, uh, he, this, this reflector is designed to re uh, reflect ones that are in the micron to millimeter range. These are actually neutrinos that are of that scale, and they're not moving like at relativistic speeds. And so he's lensing them onto the isotope, and then he's looking at the um, very high energy beta, so he's discriminating for high energy beta, and in that case, you see the the biggest change. So he's modulating the beta emission via these masons. No, what it, what it is is he was demonstrating something uh, or learning something. I mean, there's a lot of papers being produced now in the West about how neutrinos are the be all and end all of anything, and it's the future of energy and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, I have a hilarious story that I'll tell you, which I told you on the, in the car on the way over. Or last night. Um, so, um, but but anyway, he, he's he's basically there is a flux of neutrinos, and the neutrino flux affects so much. So there was a group uh, uh, operate uh, headed by a guy called Xu Wenzhou in 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 China uh, between 1988 and 1999, and uh, what they did is they 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 were working off. Uh, um, a, a, a study that was done in 1954 by a Nobel Prize winner, but he did it, did it for uh, uh, economics, where he look, looked at a pendulum, a Foucault pendulum, and during a, uh, a solar eclipse, the pendulum moved in an odd way. Uh, and, and so it, they were working off that, and they looked at the historical data uh, from atomic clocks in the US and they found out that during three body alignments, there was a the, the change. The, the, there was a change in the beta decay, which you could measure because there was a fluctuation in the accuracy of the time uh, during those moments when the shadow passed over that atomic clock. And so they repeated experiments using rubidium eighty-seven, which is a beta isotope. It's a natural primordial isotope, and also uh, uh, cesium one thirty-seven, which is an artificial uh, uh, beta emitting isotope. And they found that in both cases, when you had something under the shadow and something over here, that um, the, the, the clocks would diverge in their timekeeping. Um, he also looked at uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, crystallization of a lead tin alloy, so the solidification uh, from, a, from a melt. And under the uh, 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 shadow of the eclipse, you actually had long crystal grains growing whereas you didn't when it wasn't under the shadow of the eclipse. He also found that um, uh, he had a metal sheet and it was suspended, and during the eclipse there was a sideways pressure they could measure on a strain gauge. And he also measured that um, the uh, spectral lines from elements changed uh, during the eclipse. They actually changed. So uh, one common factor was having all of these different uh, effects. Now, there is a book, it's freely available online, and it's written by Simon Schnoll, and he's looked at uh, over 100 papers published since 1954, and they found that there's a common process in every stochastic uh, 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 process. There's a common thing. 
And that is the subject of uh, much of the research in this book. <coughs> and you can see here the, the isotopes are going down, over, uh, up and down over the year. And essentially what it is, is because neutrinos were of whatever flavor can be affected by gravity, when the Earth is closer to the sun, the solid angle from the sun of the amount of neutrinos coming from the sun doesn't change. But the gravity lenses more of the cosmic flux of neutrinos into the path of the, the Earth's surface. So you, you have a change in the rate of decay of beta isotopes. And that's how he proved. Can you stop the final things for a second? Yeah. Oh. I'm going to fix on just one point that What's you that? Made. Yeah. Okay. You have a, a focal pendulum. Yeah. It's swinging back and forth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can design such a thing oh, way past 10 to the 6th oh, right. accuracy. You can use it to make a pot. But you say that there's a close enough effect that you can measure with a stream yeah. gauge. Yes, it's even on NASA's site. Okay. Can you quantify that? Uh, how, how much is, I mean. Oh, you, it, you, you, you'll have to look at the word, but if you look at Foucault Pendulum, oh God, what's his name? I can't remember it right now. Okay. Yeah. But, but I mean, you can measure that for force with the stream gauge. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you know what that force is, and you know how long it lasts because uh, you know how long an arc in the clips lasts, you should be able, to, uh, be able to make a statement about you know, what the ch change in frequency of clock is going to be. Uh, can you quantify that? How much is it? How much is, how much is the change in force? Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, just, well, that one, just that one little point. Yeah. Uh, certainly, the, it was a marked change. I, can't, I, I don't have the, the, yeah. the figures of those I things. Mean, but that's shocking because. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a difference between a, a, a inertia and, and gravity, and, 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 and the, the equivalence of the two has been established to I don't know, dozens of dozens. Uh, of two years after Frederick Rains worked, co-discovered or established that neutrinos were a thing, mm -hmm. at least uh, fast neutrinos. No, they, they actually d d detected neutrinos from uh, from a decay process. Here in America, I don't know where it was, but it's Frederick Rains. He won the Nobel Prize for it. Okay. okay. Two years later, a Japanese nuclear researcher suggested that neutrinos are what is the, what causes gravity. It's how gravity is propagated. Okay. Uh, and there's a guy called Bill or Bob McGrath or something, and he works for CERN. And in 2012, I think he wrote wrote a a paper suggesting that relic neutrinos are what are responsible for, for gravity and how gravity propagates. And, and it's funny because when I send these papers to Alexander Parfumov, he says, oh, it's great that people are finally catching up with things that we hypothesized in the 70s and 80s and we've already experimentally proven. <laughs> so they're so far ahead in Russia and they're doing it with tin cans and pieces of metal and, and a, a fragment of a beta isotope. <laughs> 20 years he's been running that experiment. And, and every year it's the same. The, the decay rate changes. So right now, I think MIT have had, have a, a device where they, they have tritium in there and that they, that they're trying to de decay. And I think you get like seven decays or whatever it is, excess or because of neutrinos per year or something. It's so ridiculously low to, to be measurable. And so you, normally you have to have like to measure the plutonium rate in a, in a nuclear reactor, you have one meter cubed of water and you, you look for scintillation flashes. And for look at, looking at uh, uh, neutrinos from a cosmic, from, from a cosmic or origin but in the, in the relativistic neutrinos, they have white, like one cubic mile. We were discussing it. Ice uh, cube. Uh, ice cube. And, uh, and I, ice cube. So, you know, but um, relic neutrinos are a different thing. And, and, and so th this comes to the point of his hypothesis uh, which I'm going to be presenting at the, the conference uh, as, a, as a poster uh, in uh, a week or so's time. He's saying that uh, over uh, 1,000 degrees, but it is better to be about 1,100 degrees C, you start to get uh, energy uh, of electrons in a metal lattice or in a liquid sufficiently high enough so that when they collide into each other, uh, they uh, synthesize a, a neutrino anti neutrino pair. Uh, whereas if you're in a gas, because of the numbers of electron density, you, you have seven orders of magnitude less chance of this occurring. So it's some phenomenal numbers of magnitude, uh, uh, the chance of this occurring. The interaction of those relic neutrinos, uh, sorry, those synthesized ultra-low energy neutrinos is so low, but they interact with so many atoms, and you produce so many of them, that the chances go up, and they actually start playing a role. And, and so 
this was very interesting because I was telling Dr. Brian Ahern, who was former head of MOT, uh, uh, blah, 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 uh, literally a couple of days ago, uh, Parker Moll's theory. And he says, and, and this was, a, I think it was like, what did I say, 4 o'clock or 4.30? 4 he says, this is amazing. I can, he says, I've, t I've just been told at 12.30 today that they've got this new battery and they heat cesium-137, he, he says it's cesium, but he thinks it's cesium-137, which is a beta emitter, up to 1,100 degrees, and it just produces electricity. He says, and you're telling me this now. <laughs> and I said it was like, I said it, uh, uh, to Tom, I said, it's, it's like when you have uh, a word that you never knew existed, and, and, and suddenly you hear that word, and now it's everywhere. It's in the newspaper articles. People are saying it on TV. And this is the thing about communication. When people have no a, a fundamental core level, they cannot even conceive that this is possible. It's just... They can't recognise the signal in the noise. Even if you were showing it to them, it's like, there it is. And you go, it's just... To them, they can't hear it. This reminds me of a possible analogy. Uh... People uh, in past centuries must have observed chaotic behavior, simple mechanical systems, and they always denied what they were seeing until, what, 50 years ago when we, now we have chaos theory, we apply it in many different ways, and uh, it was always there, and, and good observers were most obviously seeing it, and just never, maybe it's in somebody's notes, but it never got published, and they denied it. Uh, so it seems to me this is... So, so going back to what you were saying, people literally have so much indoctrination about this. And also there's the reputation trap because, and, and this is not true in Italy, they're bonkers. They're absolutely bonkers. And they're willing to do things and take risks. The Russians will do it because if, they, if there's one milli, milli, like nanometer chance of this being real, they'll have a go. And they, they don't want to. They don't want to have to fill in a grant application, wait two years, and you, you know build something. And it, it won't even get a grant unless it's costing five million. You know, it's <laughs> no. They, they'll go. I have an idea. There's things in my drawer that I can go and go. I'll finish that tin of sardines, and we'll use that. <laughs> and they're making calorimeters out of it. And they'll see. Okay, there's an effect. And and then after well, they've done it for so long, they suddenly go. You know. Okay, now maybe I need to just test it a little bit more accurately. But you have this Agent Smith thing where people, they just step up and they go, it's not true, it can't be real. And you don't need it to get to any politician or, or anyone that can make a decision to take this forward because it's already stopped by your family. Your family are telling you because they already know it's not possible. But what, what's happening with, 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 with the concepts surrounding neutrinos is that they can interact uh, with, with nuclei, and the, the coolant barrier is irrelevant. Now, what's happened in Russia um, is they've taken on board the work of a guy called Ken Shoulders. I wanted to talk about him in my talk, but there's so much cool stuff to show you about what I've seen under the SEM that I want to focus on that. But Ken Shoulders, we, we have phones. You know, I guess everyone's got a phone or a computer or something that's got an IC in it, <laughs> right? He developed the, mic the, the screening technology for making microelectronics. He also uh, 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 invented the thing that's being currently testing some of the samples I have in Australia right now, called the quadrupole mass spectrometer. Exactly. In fact, theirs is a triple quadru quadrupole mass spectrometer, which is the, the gold standard right now. Um, this same guy <coughs> looked at a guy called John Hutchison, and a couple of years later, he's working on this work that was done in the 1950s at the Naval Research Labs, and, and he's expanding that where they are looking at condensed electron, electrons and, you know, plasmoids, but um, Bostick called them plasmoids. But these things are, are self-confining. Uh, if you can imagine lightning, right, it's, it's like a plasma pitch, yeah? Now, if you can imagine lightning, but it, instead of going down from point A to point B, it's just going, <laughs> and it doesn't stop. <laughs> and the simple way to think about it is... Um, uh, if, if you are, you, you, you can make this, and uh, uh, Faraday made them. Uh, get a box, you put some smoke in it, you have a hot, hot hole there, and you go <coughs> like that. Sorry, I'm not going to get a drink there now. Um, 
what Dave's watching. Uh, yeah, and it, it produces a soliton. But in the case of that soliton, it's just going around like that. And it's very stable, and it can go a long distance. And in fact, you can, you can knock some, some card over at the other side of the room if you've got a really good soliton launcher. It goes through the air, you can't even see it, but the thing gets knocked over on the other side of the room. Very stable, really stable under water. Dolphins know how to make them under water. water. And there's a classic video on, on YouTube where there's a bunch of dive divers and they're playing a competition by making solitons out of bubbles and then knocking rock piles of rocks over under the water. So but the, the, the solitons that are produced by electrical discharge. So uh, one, of, one of the reactors I may talk about and I, I can share with you is, is a guy in the UK. Uh, he calls himself Lion. Some people like to keep private. But essentially, uh, I, I suggested a long time ago using uh, 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 industrial abrasives. The reason was is because there was diamonds growing on Chilani's wire, and I thought that might be important. I didn't realise at that particular time. I was I was thinking more of the D by and and the fact that the, 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 they have this huge thermal capacity and so forth. But di diamonds are actually the the um, best uh, uh, electron emitters there are. There's no, no other better, and especially if they're crappy diamonds, you know, they've got a bit of nitrogen in there. So um, what he's got is he takes 3M diapads, right? Uh, these are the kind of abrasives that you would use, like if you've cut a piece of glass, you know, you scored it, cut the glass, and you just want to take off the sharp, sharp, sharp edge. It's just little, little nickel pads on a, on a large foam pad with industrial diamonds embedded into them. So it's already great, isn't it? We've got nickel. Matsumoto said in 1992, the nickel doesn't absorb hydrogen. It produces a dense cluster of nitrogen on the surface. Okay? Uh, it actually forms some sort of weird structure out of, uh, sorry, out of hydrogen, rather. So what he does is he bakes these diamond uh, pads. He scrapes them off the, the, the pad. He puts them into a, 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 a nest tin, you know, like an army nest tin. Puts them in the oven, the domestic oven, uh, for a week at 200 degrees. Because he hasn't got any better equipment, so that's what he uses. He's got a domestic oven, he's got a bed nest in. So he does that. And then what he, he gets a, a little vial of um, uh, deuterium oxide, uh, fairly affordable. And then the point, he takes it out and he immediately, as it's 200 degrees, dumps it straight into the deuterium oxide and he leaves it soaking in there for a number of weeks. Then what he does is he puts it into a little alumina tube, wraps two, two rounds of copper wire around it, puts that into a, a quartz tube, and then there's a, the Cantal heater wire around the outside and slowly heats it up. It gets some absolutely crazy effects. And uh, you haven't got those samples with me, but I'll bring them tonight so I can show them. You can see some of the effects. And, and some <coughs> of the effects uh, uh, are, in my view, caused by these solitons, which then can cluster together. And when they get very big, they can do some really weird stuff. Now, if you imagine the soliton is an electromagnetic structure made out of electrons, and it's pinching down on itself, well, what happens when you blow air into a tire and you keep putting more air into the same space? PV equals NRT, it gets hotter, and it gets hotter, and it gets hotter. Well, why wouldn't these plasma pinches on the same semi-permanent basis get so hot that particle theory would mean they're synthesizing the neutrinos? And if they are synthesizing neutrinos, well, that would explain why Alexander Shishkin, who works at Dubna in Science City, that's north of Moscow, and that's where they've made most of the heavy elements in the last sort of 20 years by firing alpha particles into already heavy elements. Uh, and that's where they made the nuclear bombs and blah, blah, blah. Um, he and a whole team of other Russian scientists, they've established that these uh, 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 dark black EVOs, as Ken Shoulders saw, uh, called them, which can go straight through metal, and can carry ions within them. Uh, they leave these little birdies on x-rays. These are and can only be composed of, uh, 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 largely composed of condensed neutrinos. And so what I'm looking in, in when I'm looking at an SEM, I, I'm not looking necessarily for changes in elements. For me, as, as I said to you last night, it's like it's so predictable now, it's boring. <laughs> the elements will be. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter where you well, start. Let me stop a bit for a second. What he, the statement he just made, he's already well beyond this stuff, but he now has documented evidence that I can take a very simple uh, hydrogen oxygen gas uh, made by this Amasa machine, apply it uh, on a flame to a material of one type, say titanium, and out of that come a whole range of elements that weren't there in forms that are clearly not contamination. And he's got.
have documented pictures. You're going to see it today. We have samples in our product. Uh, I'll our give it in samples. You can look at the bullet plate, obviously. I can look at this afternoon, right after this, and spend 90 minutes on our SEM with a good uh, SEM operator that uh, you has found, and hopefully document that this, in fact, is true. So for the physicists, maybe maybe we're barking up the wrong tree. Maybe we should talk to the geologists and say, here's how elements on Earth are created. They might be interested. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, there are geologists. So, so uh, Russian geologists uh, found uh, that uh, there were neutrino, neutron emissions during uh, um, earthquakes. And they studied this for decades. And then a, a guy in Italy took up the mantle called Alberto Carpenteri. And he found that if you take uh, like uh, quartz and you crack it, you don't get anything. But if you, if you take a, um, a hematite and you crush that, and it must be a brittle fracture. It mustn't it may be a ductile fracture. It must be a brittle fracture. You produce thermal neutrons. And they, they, they say that this is the reason why the um, east part of the, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, oh, the sea that's south of France. Anyway, there. <laughs> how tired I am. <laughs> Mediterranean, there we go. The ge ge geography question for you. Um, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, uh, um, it's got a higher level of salt in it because they're synthesized uh, from all the volcanic activity and the neutrons that are coming out of the volcanic activity. Um, and we, we tried to replicate this actually up in Minnesota a number of years ago, but we made the mistake of not asking what type of neutron detector, or rather we weren't told. We, 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 had, a, we had fast neutron detectors, not thermal neutron detectors, so our experiment failed because we had the wrong type of, and this is just an example of where things can fail for those kind of reasons. But this Lion reactor... Oh, yeah, so I'll explain how that works if you want. So, oh, yeah, so what's going on in the Lion reactor? I mean, this is, the, this is sort of this Lion reactor death sort of thing that has occurred. Well, I wish he would say everything that it can do, but um, uh, uh, what's already out there is, is pretty cool. And, and it's eminently replicatable. Uh, the problem was he thought it was running at 830 degrees, and that was because his uh, thermocouple was offset. It, when we uh, actually worked out, uh, after several people had attempted to replicate it, it was actually running at 1080 degrees, which, by the way, is very close to Parkinson's switch on temperature. <laughs> Ta-da! Um, so uh, essentially what's happening is your diamonds are producing uh, a, a, like a, a, an emission of electrons. They're, they're loaded up with deuterons. Uh, the reason deuterons are important is because they're already a boson. What's important about a boson? A boson can occupy the spe same space time, uh, whereas a, 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 a hydrogen atom has to be either as a molecule or it has to be with one electron to be a boson to be able to participate, and that <laughs> produces problems. But, uh, a deuterium is good because it's already a boson nucleus. It's bo boson, as, uh, you know, in a various many, many ways. And it has uh, extra neutrons, uh, uh, which is always good for nuclear process. So, and just a second. The, the boson fermion, I just recently found this. Yeah, it has to be an even number of half charges to be, to, be, to be a boson. And that has special properties, but fermion has an odd number. Well, fermions can't occupy the same space time. Uh, that you can get a couple of fermions together, like two electrons can form a Cooper pair, and that's the basis of superconductivity. Uh, and so they become a boson. Um, so basically, it, it, it already has a ready supply of boson, but it's carbon, isn't it? And carbon-12 is also a boson. So you've got lots of food for this structure. And what, what Shoulders established was that these solitons of electrons, uh, they can uh, literally strip the electrons off other atoms, and they can grab their nucleus, and they can get the nucleus spinning around it or, or carried with it. And in fact, what, what Shishkin has done in Russia with his team over the last nine years is they've shown that they can pass these structures. They, they create them in a, in a cavitator. So they, they have a pump uh, with a disc, and the disc has holes cut into it, and it spins around. You could bake this, but by the way, I'll tell you that it can kill you quite quickly. Um, it spins around at 5,000 RPM. And uh, he has x-rays on the outside, and x-rays at a distance. And they get these little birdies. And the, the birdies are formed by these, uh, um, uh, these dark black evos, these solitons that have basically lost their electrons. They may even have lost their nucleus. But whatever they travel through, so if they travel through nitrogen, there is a crater on the x-ray next to this birdie, or a number of craters. 
or if they travel through oxygen or they travel through xenon, the di diameter of the crater and the depth of the crater is directly proportional to the nucleus that is being captured in inside this soliton. So they've, they've characterized this well, and they, they've got the formula, and, and it was presented at Sochi la, la, last year. So they already know and they accept that, that you can take matter and teleport it. That's what they're doing. That's where the danger comes in, because these things can go into your body. And this is one thing that he warned about the, the energy that can be imparted by the particles as these things go boom. They shoot out whatever they're carrying, and, and, and whatever they're carrying lost all its charge and mass, which is weird, because you, you can then break all <coughs> kinds of laws. Um, and you can even use it as an impulse engine, because if you take something here, you put a load of particles into it, then you put it in like the 200 volt, you can accelerate up to good fractions of the speed of light, and then you get the, out, the confining structure to break away, but the, the, the nuclei that were travel inside it are now traveling with one tenth of the speed of light, but you didn't have to put that energy in. You only needed like a cathode ray tube to accelerate it that far, and then it goes smack on the other side. And this is how. Which bridge is the most fundamental It's great, isn't it? Oh, you should you should hear uh, shoulders on laws. He, he says, uh, nasty violations, nasty violations. <laughs> it says it says man-made laws, all wrong, dead wrong, okay. like this. Yes, within our framework of uh, uh, our indoctrination, they're wrong. But when you can observe these things... That, that's why you discover particles. You, dis you discover that there's a, the, the equation for energy doesn't balance. And, and so you say something did that. So you're doing it exactly backwards. The crazy thing is the particles you put in might not be particles you get out. But, but then you find the particles which, which shows that your theory is right. Hmm? You find the particle that you're looking for. I mean, that's that's what cyclotrons do. Yeah. You look for the energy, and, and it's not. Well, cy cyclotrons aren't generally using these electromagnetic structures of uh, these basically high-density charge clusters, as they call them. Everything's a charge cluster. A piece of dust is a charge cluster, but <laughs> these are specific structures of charge clusters. And in fact, they use. That's why you make dust bunnies. Yeah. So it's essentially, getting back to the line reactor, so it's emitting, um, and this is, this is how I see it mentally, you've got a point, okay? And when you actually look at the, the, the SEMs, the, the diamond is here, and it's in a pocket where the nickel is holding it, right? At the end of the reactor, there's no diamond! <laughs> But on certain vertices, and it, uh, uh, certain uh, points of the diamond, uh, uh, and it's in a line, and it's not always the same like angle of, of the diamond. It, you know, there might be one there that's that angle, there that's that same angle, but for some reason this one and this one actually did this effect. Um, uh, it's uh, eaten away at the nickel, and if you go right in with the SEM, you see that the, the nickel has basically been consumed, and then some of it, when the music stopped, reappeared into our space-time, into absolutely perfect crystals. And the way they've grown is like, this crystal grew at this point in space-time, this crystal grew at this point in space-time, and then they go, whoop, and they join together. They have not like grown from here out. They, 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 they reappeared with one of these evos, with all of the matter that was encapsulated inside them, and they've just reappeared. And uh, you see this with this technology quite often, and, and we have an example that I, I brought back and we're going to put on the SEM uh, today, where you get these absolutely perfect crystal structures reforming when the material that's captured uh, comes back into our free space. Um, and so, uh, essentially, you're, you're emitting these donuts. The donuts are capturing, they go around and they can eat the nickel and they can come back and eat the, in fact, what they actually do is they eat nickel 58, they eat nickel uh, 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 60, they eat nickel 62, they eat nickel 64. They have a problem with nickel 61, but if there's two atoms in nickel 61, it can go in because it's, it's, a, it's a fermion. So it kind of gets left behind. Uh, so you end up with certain uh, isotopes uh, uh, being enriched. Uh, 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 when you run these, these processes, and it's typically the fermionic isotope. Either so because so is that kind of the reason why, uh, why uh, Rossi's reactor, there was a preponderance of nickel 62 in the. Uh, no, the reason nickel 62 yeah. is there is because it's about, about binding energy, and uh, it's basically the most efficient packing of nucleons you can get. 
Mm. There's iron 56 and there's nickel, nickel 62. So what this technology wants to do is it wants to take as much matter as possible and put it into the smallest box possible. And you're going to see some things on the Hutchison samples which are going to literally freaking blow your mind if you actually care. <laughs> because uh, that you can see what nature has tried to do. It's, it's, been, it's, it's been put into a situation where it wants to pack as much as it can possibly get into a very small space, and it hasn't done it. So what it's done, it's completely reorganized the atoms that it's taken in to two other atoms that can then occupy the same space-time. What I'm talking about is taking a piece of aluminium, and at certain points of field interference, that the... the intensity of the crushing force there has forced the aluminium, which is a fermion, a 27 aluminium fermion, to merge together and produce magnesium and silicon, both of which are bosons. Well, there are bosonic options. There's no bosonic option for aluminium. It's all a fermion. It's 27 aluminium. And, and when it comes back into the space-time, when it comes back into the space-time, the uh, the atoms, the, 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 the aluminium has, has diverged around its mean <laughs> into, has grown in size because the atomic size of those atoms is slightly larger than aluminium for both of them, so both silicon and, 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 uh, um, uh, and magnesium. Both their atomic sizes are bigger than the atomic size of aluminium. So you've taken uh, two units of aluminium that are, are down here in atomic size, and you've made one unit of magnesium, one unit of silicon, so, and you, you actually see these pimples that have come out, which are rich in magnesium and silicon, in a sea of aluminium, and in the sea of aluminium, there's regular points where the field interference occurred across, like, like dots on a, on a, like on a, a, like on a piece of graph paper, and you've gone dot, 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 and they are blisters of changed elements. <coughs> so, balloon fissions? No, it, it fission, it, it, no. It nucleon exchanges. You get two, new, two atoms of uh, uh, aluminium, and you get one atom of uh, um, uh, magnesium, and you get one atom of uh, uh, silicon out of it. What is it that fission? It's, it's, it's nucleon exchange. Okay. So, so Lena, now I will walk you so through. If it were fission, you would get uh, something smaller. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're actually saying you're taking two aluminums and you're. You're tearing off some protons and neutrons. No, 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 no. The EVO, the exotic vacuum object, the soliton, this, this thing that I'm talking about from shoulders, it basically creates black holes. Or any, shoulders says, to all intents and purposes, it looks like a black hole, right? Now, Matsumoto actually observed Hawking radiation in 1992 and published it in Fusion Technology. He showed the black hole white, white, the outer of the black hole and the inner of the black hole. And he showed these things until fusion technology decided to say, look, it's not fusion unless it produces tritium and helium. So we don't want to publish any papers unless it shows those things. Adam, uh, Adamenko, uh, and I won't show this slide because I'm going to tell you now, so you'll get to hear it, but others won't. Um, Adamenko, who ran a, a six-year, 100-person program in the former isotopic lab outside of Kiev, he learned the Soviet method of cold nuclear transmutation, as they called it, in 1957. And by 1998, he managed to raise enough money with a private guy to buy this facility, put together this team. First experiment worked, and every experiment after worked repeatedly, every single time. And he had a 300 joule capacitor bank. He had a, um, a, an electrode, a flat electrode, the cathode, uh, then he had a alumina sheath, like, like, a, like a cup, put over the end. And then he had a very fine uh, anode. And the anode was pretty much every element he tried. Uh, and it's all documented in the 700-page book, which I have with me. <laughs> uh, uh, it's in digital form. It's 160 quid, so, but it's well worth a read. Um, you'll understand a lot about this process. Um, and what happens is the, the electrons all bunch up in there, and uh, then they discharge in a, a kind of relativistic discharge. That is a plasma pinch, but also you get a, len a lensing effect like this, a bit like it's a mini sapphire. Effectively, it's a mini sapphire reactor, if you know what that is. But anyway, that's what it is. Um, and, and this causes uh, transmutation, and he, he can get every element in the periodic table. Not only that, he gets elements which have 455 ANU. 
which is not even in our near universe. He synthesizes synthesize these things. But the most curious thing he's... He, he, what was the half life? That? that must have been immediately came apart. How did so it, it, it broke up into alpha particles, and this is why you get, uh, in Lennard reactions, if you push them too hard, not only do you get alpha particles synthesized in the low part, but when you're doing gently, but if you push it to the nth degree all right, with cavitation uh, or, or, or with these kind of plasma pinches... You end up with stellar type of distribution of, of production of elements, and they are separated by alpha. But you, you can even achieve this, because al alpha is the, the most easy packing density, the best packing density there is. This is why you get the most energy from making it. So uh, there's a guy called Stoyan Sargachev, and he has a theory about the structure of matter. Proton takes one unit, it's like one can, right? A neutron takes uh, uh, one, one unit of space time. Now, when, when you have a, a, a deuteron, it has the neutron and the proton in the same space-time. So imagine there is no cam, we've just got the one cam. Now our deuteron is occupying that space-time. Now if you add another neutron to that, you get tritium, and that is occupying the same space-time. Okay? Now, if you add another proton, you make helium. Okay? And it still occupies the same space-time. So... The, the helium nucleus is, is basically the, the, the most efficient packing. And every time you free up distortion in space-time, you get energy. It doesn't matter whether it's chemical energy or whether it's a, a nuclear energy. It all comes up from less distortion in space-time. And so uh, that is basically where you're getting your energy from. So building atoms that are with, with helium nuclei... Uh, are effectively uh, alpha particles, basically, are trying to... It's the result of trying to put things into a small box. So the system is trying to put things into a small box. Now, what Adamenko found was he, was... he was using a process called secondary iron mass spectrometry, where you fire a primary iron into your sample to try and detect what secondary ions are spallated off the surface. So you go... Bits come off, and you detect by time of flight, the amount of time it takes for those things to go down the drip tube, what element isotopes you've got in your sample. So he, he was firing it in there, and he wasn't seeing any secondary ions coming off this bit that he wanted to look at. None at all. He thought, what's going on here? So, so then he sort of turned the machine off to, to try and see if there was something wrong. And in the photomultiplier, he could see a glow, and it exponentially decayed. That's odd, isn't it? So they turned it back on, they shot the primary ions in, turned it off again, glow, exponentially decayed. Well, what they realised, they weren't even seeing the primary ions. Whatever it was, was eating the primary ions. And in fact, around that central part, they also found a ring. It was an irregular ring, and around it there were also spots of a smaller size that were also eating ions. You never got out what you put in, but you did get light and energy. The matter went in and light and energy came out. It's Hawking radiation. Same thing that Matsumoto published in 1992. Right? It's what happens when a black hole eats energy in the form of matter. It puts out a bit of it, it spins it off. So what we're talking about, quite honestly, is synthesizing black holes to a certain degree. Uh, or something that, to all intents and purposes, is like a black hole. But if you get rid of the electronic confinement structure, what was in the black hole, which has lost all dimension. So this thing that was... A, the, I, I've now got helium, or deuterons, and I've got one trillion, and they're all occupying the space of this can because they're a boson, OK? But I'm squashing it, squashing it down. So effectively, everything you put in there has lost its mass and it, its identity. Then... You can move that around as if it has no mass. Okay? But then when you kill the confining structure, it goes, bloop, and all of those helium nuclei come back into our space-time. And they organize themselves, and I, I, I firmly believe, they organize themselves into a pattern that is relative to the nuclei that are available to it in the environment. So if you imagine the Big Bang, it's all energy, it's all coming out there. And someone decided to be Muhammad, someone decided to be Buddha, and someone decided to be, you know, Jesus. And they're, they're all, all there. And as the energy is trying to condense, it crystallizes on each one. It follows that tribe, that tribe, that tribe. Yeah? So you end up with a bit of gold, you end up with a bit of silver, you end up with a bit of antimony. 
because there's a pattern. Just like crystals like to grow on crystals, just like metals like to <coughs> coalesce as, as, as things are cooling, I believe this is not just, you know, just like society likes to group with like-minded people, you know? This is, this is a natural phenomenon. Why, why should it stop at the level of a nucleus when it's, being con when it's uh, uh, condensing out of just pure energy? One of the things that Childers has said is that uh, he sees a correlation between the things he observes on a micro scale and ball lightning. Yeah, well, the ball lightning is the same thing. And uh, so it's just a larger scale, et cetera. So, so are there indications that ball lightning can actually create these? It's slide five in my presentation that I'm going to show tonight. But the, the, the spectra that was recorded in China for the first time ever, uh, a number of years ago, of ball lightning, shows the production of silicon, iron, calcium. These are some of the single, like, this is what I'm saying to you earlier, that I was saying to you? It's absolutely boring. You, whatever element you put in, you get carbon, silicon, al aluminum, whatever. Now, you, by, by controlling it in certain ways, by, by favoring the production of proton emission or, or favoring the pr production of alpha or, or starting with your elements in a particular place, and we have a calculator which you can use to choose your elements, and it's hilarious because when, when you see real data and, and you put it through the calculator, it's like, oh yeah, of course. Because it's trying to do the most energy, energetically favorable outcome. What is the meaning of the most energetically favorable outcome? It means that you're packing things into the smallest box possible because the distortion of space-time will be minimum, so the energy will be maximum. But it does like to balance things as well. So it's, it's a great, this, this EBO, this exotic vacuum object, is basically a, is the great balancer. And it's going on in your body, it's going on in lightning strikes, it's going on in streams, it's going on in bacteria, all through the universe. And we are, to, to say this isn't happening is so laughable. It's, as Shoulder said, it's completely ubiquitous. Completely ubiquitous. And it's like we are in a separate parallel universe where we deny it's occurring. There's, I'll, I'll say it now, but it doesn't matter if I say it later. There's, there's a, the, the first uh, uh, biological transportation experiments conduct, work, uh, have, that have been recorded, and you can check uh, Jean-Paul Baderian on this because he's written uh, a book called uh, uh, Lone to Nuclear Action or Cold Fusion in all its forms. But anyway, in 1798, they were doing bio biological transmutation experiments. One of the typical ones is you take mung bean seeds, you know, you, you, the, the ones you have in stir fry, and they're great if you haven't grown them at home. I seriously recommend it. You just need a, 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 a tetra pack carton, and you wash it out, and you put just one layer of soaked for 24 hour mung beans at the bottom, and you just wash it twice a day, and uh, four or five days later, you've got some fresh, tasty mung beans. But anyway, this, these experiments, they use deionized water, they, met, they take a, a sample of the mung beans, they uh, produce dry weight, and they analyze the proportion of elements that, within them. Then they grow them, and they analyze the proportion of elements within them. And typically, a successful experiment will see the production of calcium, uh, like an increase in calcium uh, over potassium. What is that? It's a proton being pushed into the calcium nucleus, or it's a forced decay of, of potassium-40, which is a beta isotope. But the so vanishingly small amount of uh, 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 potassium-40, uh, it's probably not that. It probably is the other isotopes being, uh, having a proton added to them. Now, many people have tried this experiment. In some cases, they've just failed, right? Why? Don't know. But some cunning people in, in India who, they're big on the auspicious days. Right, you know, there's a right time to plant a seed. There's a right time to have a wedding. There's a right time to pick your nose. You know, everything has a right time in India. Okay, uh, basically, they they decided to start doing experiments on on, a, on like a five day, you know, set the seeds every five days or whatever. And what they found was, true enough, with the lunar cycles, you got actual transmutation occurring. Then. At other times, you didn't get transportation occurring. Now, what have I said? Relic neutrinos can be gravitationally lensed. If they can be gravitationally lensed, that then during certain phases of the moon, when there's a, a certain alignment occurring, the actual seed has more access to relic, relic neutrinos and therefore can actually synthesize 
elements that it needs in order to germinate and grow better. This is why you can't have a rotating spaceship because centripetal force is not enough, or centrifugal force is not enough for life. You need a gravity source. You will need to have your spacecraft to have a black hole in the middle because you will need to have a flux of neutrinos for any kind of healthy living in space. That's a complete aside. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, that's far point. beyond the uh, Lenner as an energy source, <laughs> there's no doubt. Uh, now, getting back to... Uh, uh, my, my mind is being blown, I'm sorry to say Yeah, that. It's, it's tough. It, you know, it, it's you wait till you see the pictures tonight. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this is the entree. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and I've got samples in my pocket, too. So yeah, you can look at them all day long. Does that mean that the these are irradiating me with... Uh, with well, so, so here's the thing. Um, there was a paper published uh, by, I think it's an Italian uh, professor. It's, it, I, I linked to it in, in the uh, YouTube promoting the, the, the launch of this book. And it's not part of Alexander's work. But essentially, with neutrino processes, it does not matter whether you start with a radioactive element or a non-radioactive element. You cannot have an energetically favorable outcome that produces an unstable element. Okay? So... If you give it an unstable element, it'll make stable elements from it. If you give it a stable element, it'll make stable elements from it. So you won't have it. Where, where that goes wrong is when you are pushing the system too hard. So with the Adamenko, it's, it's a phenomenal stellar event. So you do get these big atoms, and they collapse, and they chuck out fast alpha particles, and they go and hit other nuclei, and they become unstable elements. So it's not that the process didn't want to do it, it's you were just pushing it too far. And this is one of those situations where bigger is not better. I've been saying for about two years now, you have to treat this with love and care. You know, you push it too hard, you, you'll, you'll, it, it, it'll do bad things. So, for instance, with, with the very simple device of Shishkin's, one hour exposure is enough to kill you. And that's just a pump rotating around with holes in it. It, it'll go in, it'll tested smash you. Tested that on mice? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Tested it on mice. Yeah, the Russians seem to be, the, the, the another term for these EVOs are strange radiation. And uh, Bob has observed a lot of tracks. Where these things actually kind of eat their way through matter. Uh, well, there's, leave tracks behind. There's, there's some that, that could be three body interactions, uh, where you have a soft body, a hard body, and a piece of grid. And as it moves around, the, the bit of grit grow, rolls and its, its crystal structure smashes into the surface. The very interesting thing is that EVOs can form a crystal. Okay? And this has been shown by Russian researchers uh, called Bogdanovich, and they were doing uh, discharges where they have a water stream, and they put the discharges through it, and they create white EVOs, they create black EVOs. And, and the black EVOs are great, because you have a plasma discharge behind, and the photo shows a toroid, which the light is not able to go through. It's not a physical object. It's eating the light. It's not a black hole, it's a black donut. <laughs> and, and so uh, these, and you know what he did? In his latest paper published in May, they actually videoed these things moving across a surface at about two microns an hour or something, very slow, or two, two microns a minute, going across the surface, glowing and transmuting matter. Two days after the exposure to the discharge. Now, Sam Batamova, another Russian researcher, observed treated material, transmuting elements and growing outcrops of different elements two months afterwards. And I have it on good authority that it's known in this country that these things have been able to do this. And it's been known in certain circles for a long time. But you're not allowed to know. It's interesting. The, uh, the uh, Ken Shoulders, um, he actually has a set of five patents. So go look at his patents. And his patents are for apparatus to create these these EVOs, to, to switch them, to accumulate them, etc. Really quite simple. Yeah. Well described. I, I don't understand the technology to make them, but you know, somebody who knows microelectronics application, which he did well, could make these things. And, uh, and, and, and he uh, put them into the patent office, and the patent office was going to classify them. Defense secret. So what he did was he wrote a book, 
He did write the book before he did that. Uh, well, he it, the it was all it's already and, out. Yeah. He basically distributed it widely and told the patent office he lost who had distributed it to, so they couldn't go ahead and have each individual and say, no, that's classified, you can't divulge it. But basically what he said is that, 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 that they, they wrote to him and said, look, uh, you know, he said, we, I've written a book and it's been distributed. And he said, well, we, we need to know who it was. He said, well, my computer's on. I don't know. I haven't even got the addresses back on. And then, then they allowed this <laughs> patents to go through in an And it's right there. Way. So when he says some others know about it, chances oh. are... I, 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 I haven't been told at Edwards Air Force Base they, they replicated a large COP using a shoulders type device. And there's no reason why not. I mean, the, the COPs that he was talking about... The, okay, so in, in 2006, uh, Shoulders presented at the Cold Fusion Conference or, or meeting at MIT. And he told them, you're not going to be able to produce uh, excess heat with this practically. You're not going to be able to do it. Uh, reason being is, if you push it too hard, it will eat every confinement structure that you put it in. There is not a thing in this physical universe that you can contain it with. Now, what did I just say? The second to last word there. Physical universe. You can contain it with fields. He contained it with a penning trap. A capacitors and a magnetic field. Actually, a bit like a quadrupole, but not. <laughs> Quadrupole's just magnetic fields. A penning trap is magnetic and, and, and capacitive. And this is interesting because I have a sample I call Meteorite. You can go and see it. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to looking at that on an SEM, but that's going to be several months of work. This was sent to me by John Hutchison, and it was found growing, growing next to a large capacitor in his lab. And it basically is the nuclei of a lot of black holes. Uh, and some, some, th there's all kinds of weird stuff in there. It's got like a, a whole piece of quartz, and then it's got a, a piece of uh, plastic, but it's all fused in with everything else. <laughs> Because <laughs> when it, when it, when it, most matter is completely empty, and so when you have this black hole reappear in this space time and this black hole reappear in this space time, they, they're slightly on a different plane, and so they can completely intersect and they don't displace the matter. They just <coughs> appear completely intersected. So that that's more weirdness, but anyway. <laughs> Does uh, mylar still absorb the? Uh the uh, EVOs, at one time I so, read that. So Shoulders defined, and the, the Russians have confirmed this, that, that uh, basically it does, EVOs are an electromagnetic structure, and generally, as long as they have some charge, they don't like to go through uh, uh, impedance changes. Okay. And so the impedance change, because most EVOs are extremely small, uh, you know, you can get five, you can get them about the size of galaxies, okay? but we're not generally making them that big. <laughs> We've got a problem if we made one that big because the rest of the planet and the solar system has gone... <laughs> <laughs> so let's not make one that big. Uh, uh, the, 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 if you make them generally, they're small enough to... If you have a piece of mylar, the, and it needs to be the good mylar, not the fake mylar, it, it, aluminium-backed plastic, you have a fantastic uh, set of impedances. You've got air to mylar, you've got mylar to aluminium, aluminium to air. It just doesn't like doing it. So it, when it hits them, it just goes along. And actually, because it likes aluminium, it loves it, it eats it for breakfast. Uh, it's its favorite food, to be honest, because firstly, it's a boson. It doesn't want to be a boson. You know, it's like, I'll help you out, mate. You don't want to be a, you don't want to be a fermion, rather, sorry. Uh, you want to be a boson, mate. Um, so it fuses it into iron 54 typically, uh, 227 aluminium, iron 54. There's a big yield of energy on that. But um, uh, uh, aluminium is very conductive, and EVOs like to travel through things that are conductive, and so you're, it's trapping it on the surface and it's moving around. And uh, uh, aluminium has a low melting point, which means its electrons become even more free and accessible to the EVO. So m multiple sheets of e uh, EVOs. But the Russians have generally said that since uh, Bajatov uh, died last year, that they really want to understand uh, the risks behind uh, uh, this technology uh, before pr pursuing it too much. And I, I will tell you a risk right now to camera. <laughs> the risk is this. We already know, and, and it's the reason I'm doing certain tests. Uh, the reason I have a series of tests planned, if I can get them funded. <coughs> uh, uh, basically, in your body, 
every one trillionth atom of carbon is, you know, uh, carbon-14. Okay? So for every mole of carbon you have in your body, it's 10 to the 23. Every 10 to the 12. So you have shit loads, absolutely bucket loads of carbon-14 in everything that's carbon in your body, including your DNA. Okay? So whilst Shishkin talks about the impact of the physical particles that are uh, teleported into your body when the Evo explodes, it goes <laughs> and spits these out, which kinetically damage your lymphocytes and your leukocytes. Yeah? I'm talking about the fact that the Evos haven't exploded and they travel through your body and they interact with your carbon in your DNA and they cause the beta decay to form, form nitrogen-14 from carbon-14 and you end up with cancer. Okay? And so, Shoulders died of cancer. Matsumoto died of cancer. Uh, Piantelli has had a lot of cancer. Uh, uh, Norris Peary died of cancer very suddenly. Uh, 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 you go down the list. There is a risk with this technology if you try and push it too hard. There is a risk if you don't understand how you should shield it. But it can do amazing, amazing things. So from my point of view, the fact that like in the lion reactor, when it started to produce a lot of excess heat, it would eat the, the, the quartz, it would eat the alumina, it would eat the metals, and it all gets mashed up into a glue. Because it's, it's mixing them around. It doesn't care what it is. It'll, it'll mix this book with that, and it doesn't really change the temperature. You, you can have a book that's fused into steel, and, it, and it's like, why did that happen? <laughs> and the book paper isn't even burnt. And, and so it will destroy any containment. And so Shoulders is right, except for one thing. Piantelli solved one aspect of it. I don't know whether he knew, but Piantelli is using... As you move down the periodic table, okay, you need more neutrons. Okay? So there is a problem. As you keep pumping protons into atoms, for the atoms to be stable, heavy atoms, they need more neutrons. So you have a surplus of protons which get shot out. Piantelli saw these. They're up to 6.7 MeV. And then you can use those surplus protons to interact with lithium-7 to do the Cockroft-Walton uh, experiment, the first time fusion was ever shown in 1932 at Cambridge. Uh, and you can use it to do the boron-11 uh, to carbon-12 experiment, both a neutronic uh, 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 outcome. And so his pattern, which is valid till 2032, uh, and you can go and read it. He's, he's, he's a clever guy. I had the fortune to spend a week with him in his house, and he walked us through the process, but as he saw it then. Um, but he has like a, a variable capacitor, and on the one side he has the nickel, the nickel that's able to form these uh, hydrogen condensates, uh, that's able to interact with the nickel and form effectively these evos through what's called anharmonic oscillation, which spits out these little evos. They, they are able to result in the production of these projectiles of protons, and the protons are at the speed that accelerators make. We're back to your accelerators. <laughs> and they can interact with another plate and do the, the, the 7 lithium uh, uh, to 8 beryllium decays to 2, 4 helium, uh, or the, to the car carbon reaction. And by varying the plates like a variable capacitor, you can turn up the heat and turn down the heat. It's a, it's a nice piece of apparatus. Who is this? Uh, Francesco Piantelli. I will talk about the moment that he discovered in 19, August 1989 the actual the effect, and, and that's why he spent the rest of his life uh, dedicated to no, trying to find the same time as Fleischmann's plants. Well, there, there was March the 23rd, but yeah, it was later in the same year that, that uh, it was uh, then. So, does a, does a Omasa gas uh, create those the evos also? So I didn't know this until I got back, but in 2016, uh, um, uh, a guy, and I'll remember his name in a minute, that's because I'm tired. That's okay. Um, uh, uh, anyway, he, he gave a presentation where um, he's saying that um, the, in the process, the oxygen bonds receive a few extra electrons and they end up in a linear structure. And this has a magnetic nature, and they can group up into a ring. And then when you light it, the plasma action or discharge causes the rings to actually form EVOs. So uh, then the EVOs go and do their work. So, it's, so the mass of gas itself doesn't contain the EVOs. The EVOs may assemble the structures, 
initially. Initially. In the in the reactant. Yeah. Now they're not there. And, and then they're, they're dormant. And, then and they're it, it, he showed me a tank that's been at the same pressure for nearly 10 years now with a ga gas that's as, cap as capable as, as uh, atomic hydrogen, you know, as a, as, a, as a Langmuir torch. But it's not leaking out of the container. It can, you can compress it to a liquid. Uh, uh, the, the, the thing is that you need to mix it with a hydrocarbon, otherwise it'll eat any metal it touches. And you'll see what it's doing to the metal <laughs> later today. And it's not just eating it, it's transmuting it into all kinds of other elements. But the same ones, it's quite boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite boring after a while. It's silica and it's aluminium. What about the, um, uh, you know, there's Amos, the, you know, one of the videos you showed, uh, Amos is putting some of this gas in a little LEDs lighting. It's got, he's got a little yeah, fuel so get, cell. Yeah, so he's so, got a normal hydrogen uh, fuel cell and it yields, the energy you put in to produce the Amasa gas, it produces 10% 10, 10 more, uh, roughly 10%. Like, people like to have numbers that people can identify with it. Approximately 10% more. Uh, electricity out that it took out, in no, to then, then that. producing hydrogen uh, for, for it, it's the same it's the same uh, pen membrane type device that you yeah. probably you all use <laughs> being in a maker space <laughs> um, but the, the beauty of it is hydrogen's the leakiest stuff on earth right. well you whereas know, this stuff is not it's no not, it doesn't leak it's not leak no, at all so, you, so you, can, you can pour it into a bucket and it'll stay so there. using the amasa <laughs> gas into uh, into a fuel cell does it actually eat the fuel cell too or are you are you creating well i would imagine I, I, well uh, in the fuel cell i don't think it's getting to that plasmatic state where it would form the evo if, if we're to believe this other person's uh, take on things but because that i mean you know typically the fuel cells have uh, platinum or something of that nature. Well, yeah, so it, it, it might do, but in the lifetime of the normal, ordinary life of the, because, like I say, th th this, this technology will play nice all the time you treat it with respect, but if you give it a scenario where the Evos can cluster, just, just, just like this can can have a million cans in the same space time, you imagine a million Evos, the amount of energy these things can contain is unimaginable. It's unimaginable. You cannot fathom because you can just keep piling energy into it and it doesn't take any more room. Actually, at some point it goes and then you keep piling energy into it and it goes <laughs> it seems to have quantization levels like 5 microns, 20 microns, 50 microns, 100 microns, 250 microns. Um, and you can, when, when it starts getting up to the big size, you can physically see it. And what's happened on the Lion reactors, these clusters have got so big that they've actually come out, they've teleported themselves out of the reactor and I, I will have physically something that you, I, I would like you to give me an explanation for, because they're always lined up with the magnetic field lines of the toroid on the heater coil. But um, it's, it's actually eaten into the quartz with, with this, it looks like one of those uh, beautiful cauliflowers where you have the, the, the fractal structure on them, you know, the green ones. It looks like that where it's eaten in, but it's actually two counter-rotating vortices that are overlaid a little bit in the center. So it, you, you know that it's actually like a soliton going around that way and it's spinning this way, and, and, but its field effect is so far that these two are mashing together. You know? And there's another one on a, another one of his reactors where it's outside of the, it's come out of the reactor, it's come, come through the, the quartz, and it's come out and it's then come down and it started attacking the outside of the quartz. We're long away from the reactor, and it, but it got stuck there because there was a kink in, in the heater wire and some electromagnetic field kept it locked in place and it just ate into the, that part of the quartz. It's really quite special. Now that also, you, you had a picture of that uh, the little hole in, uh, in the Kentown wire as well too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you and, look and, at that and, under an SEM as well? Yeah, and it's, it's the same stuff. Is it? <laughs> the same transformation of matter. Yeah. yeah. If you were making a masa gas uh, with a, something that you're talking about possibly having something to eventually, well, Axel Axel and uh, I can't remember the other guy's name, they were talking about the different parts you would need. And uh, if you would burn that gas right away uh, after you made it, would you think it would still put out a lot of EVOs or not? Okay, so I'm on the fence about it actually producing EVOs at that point. It might be the fact that it's got atomic hydrogen in there. And if, if you take the Langmuir torch, what Langmuir did is he had a, a discharge going through the hydrogen as it came out. So he's making atomic hydrogen. Now, the thing about atomic hydrogen is 
that uh, it produces 4.48 EVs when the two hydrogen atoms recombine. Now, go back to what Parker Mott said. What is 4.48 e EVs? It's a shitload hotter than 1,100 degrees centigrade, oh. right? So when it hits something, it synthesizes uh, 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 ultra-low energy neutrinos, and it can then uh, transmute the matter, and then you get nuclear-level energy. And Langmuir actually observed this excess heat and was forced to retract it. <coughs> Langmuir. And this is the, the agent, even back then there were Agent Smiths getting up and saying, no, you, the same thing happened to Panath and Peters when, when they uh, did uh, whatever it was, exploding wires in Germany and whatever, or in the US, I don't know, somewhere, but anyway. Um, uh, so it might actually be the, the atomic hydrogen uh, in, in the gas. In the gas. But for some reason it's in a state where it can be very dense. Uh, and, and it's, the water crystal is keeping it. Now, we know there's water crystals because when you analyze the gas, it has these large molecules that are like a, a structure, of, like a buckyball of water. Okay. So somehow it's, it's storing extra electricity. Uh, it's storing extra... But the, the uh, ICCF-22, a guy called uh, Slobodan Stankovic, um, he's going to present his findings of transmutation using carbon. And it's, it's very similar to the, what we, we synthesized in, in the microwave reactor, which, by the way, is a bit scary. <laughs> it's the same frequency we use for Wi-Fi. Mm, that's right next to my testicles. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> so if we, like uh, continuing civilization, we need cheap energy, do you see a path? To I can see an immediate using path. Using this to uh, immediate a path. practical, scalable... Uh, immediate path. Mm. The single atom on Earth, which we've been blessed with, which has more energy per nuclear event than anything else, is uranium-235. It has 0.3 of the, half -life, of the life of the universe in terms of its half-life. And it has an unimaginable, like, 200 or 300 or something, huge amount of mega-electron volts come out from every fission event. But it produces a lot of nonsense. This technology is a practical way to clean up the nonsense. Uranium isn't that actually that rare. It is that rare. And there's other atoms you could use. So I would propose, and I actually proposed this to the MFMP, and I've got samples somewhere in my house, but I, I, I said to them in 2012, shortly after we had our first experiment, I said, look, I'm living in Kerala. I'm sitting on the biggest monazite deposit on Earth, <laughs> pretty much. You know, the highest local radiation for in, in indigenous peoples. And it's got loads of everything in it, uh, um, but plenty of thorium. Now, that's a heavy element. You get a, you get a lot of energy when you, you fission that, but sometimes you get the nasty fission products. This technology can come along and fix that fission product. You could have, therefore, nuclear reactors on the scale of, say, 10 megawatts in every little city in town. You have complete redundancy. Uh, you know, you, you, there's a hurricane. Not a problem. We just wheel one in next day. <laughs> you know, we're not waiting 20 years for it to be constructed. So... Uh, and, and you can be, modern reactors have a fail safe if there is a problem it's underground and, it, and, and uh, it's easily containable and it, there isn't actually a lot of material there and then you come along with this Amaza gas torch and you go <laughs> right put the new one in <laughs> done you know it's, it, you're solving it in minutes so how are you converting from the, uh, the nuclear reactions to heat uh, which is a so some shoulders spelled this out. You forget forget about the heat. Uh, look at capturing. You've got options of light or direct electrons. So when an evo is eating matter, it throws out two to ten keV electrons. You can then cause a, a, an, a, an avalanche with that and produce a shitload of electrons. You get you get the one electron that ionizes a whole load more. A bit like how a Geiger Muller tube works. Yeah. Right, but could that truly operate without melting everything. Right? Yeah, because it, you're just then getting slow electrons. The, the gas <coughs> absorbs the kinetic energy of the, the, the betas. <laughs> said that right now. Um, <laughs> and they, they st 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 take the cascade and then you, you generate electricity. So has that been demonstrated? I think Scholz has demonstrated it, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, there are other options, and it's one of the reasons I've been testing indium so much. You care if I take your book and put it up here and <laughs> put the crown of it? 
Anyway, this will be in English soon. By the way, he's translating it. There's a Kickstarter uh, yeah. online and uh, subscribe. Well, it's, it, the Kickstarter's finished. We raised the money. I, oh, I, I just need to finish the book. <laughs> but I'm here. <laughs> Here's some other books. Um, this, this is a, so one, one thing that's weird about this technology is if you get too much of the Evos in a metal, they'll turn into a jelly. Um, and uh, this guy, uh, Tom Bearden, uh, he uh, sent a team to uh, Russia in 1992 that spoke Russian uh, to uh, look at their implementation of this technology. And what they were doing is they're taking aluminium, they were using electromagnetic waves to turn it into a jelly. It's cold, you put your hand in it. They're pouring it into a mold, squidging it in, and then you drain the Evos out into the ground. It all sounds a bit weird until you know that I'm sitting next to George Eagley in, in India, and uh, he's like the world's expert in ball lightning. And he says, yeah, one, one time uh, this guy was telling me his uh, story. He was in a train, and this ball lightning came down by the side of the train, and it touched the window frame. And then for 20 minutes, he was able to manipulate the aluminium of the window frame with his fingers. And then you have Ralph Ring, who was uh, brought into a group who were trying to make UFOs, uh, down in uh, uh, Texas or wherever it was, but it was the it was the doorman, uh, Tesla's doorman, who Tesla invited in and showed him X, Y, and Z. And when he went to one of his first meetings with this guy, um, uh, they turned on this device, and there's a block of aluminium in front of it, and uh, Ralph Ring was able to put his hands into the aluminium and pull it out. Right inside the aluminium. Yes. And uh, there's a guy called Alex Pizarro, and uh, uh, he used to work with uh, John Hutchison. And uh, there was a piece of aluminium that, that he was treating one day. And uh, uh, then, then Alex Pizarro went over to pick it up, because uh, it tends not to get hot. In fact, it, the, the samples tend to get cold, which is a bit weird <laughs> when they're doing their funkiness. And he went over to pick it up, and, and, uh, and it smeared out of his hand. He's got his fingerprint in the piece of aluminium. And uh, I've got all the photos of those. I was going to put it in the presentation, but it's, there's so much more interesting stuff. Um, so, yeah, and, and it's documented in here uh, um, by a, a guy who has a John Alexander PhD. He, he, uh, he, his email is non-lethal. He's a, another military guy. But he, he talks about some of his experiences. So well. getting back to the, the reactors, you're, yeah. are you saying you fission the thorium and you actually use the energy, and then you just clean up the radioactive uh, fragments later on? Or are you saying I, 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 you I, 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 I think the I think this week I have observed thorium disappearing. So so in the process of it disappearing and then reappearing, the energy is released? No, I, I think first off that the fastest way is to use what this thing, system likes to do, which is make a mess of things. Right? It, it likes to make everything that's radioactive non-radioactive, and it likes to mush it all up into just boring elements like iron and, and silicon and, and aluminium. So what you do is you run your normal fission reactors, you have, have at it, go and make as many as you like. There's plenty of uranium, right? Or thorium, there's plenty of that. You can do thorium, fast breeder, whatever. And then the nonsense that you get left over at the end, you use this technology to fix it. Meanwhile, you're starting to understand about the technology. That's a part to reality for people. If you can fix, see what, what, what's happened in Germany, no one wants a nuclear reactor there, right? In Japan are having this crisis. We need energy. We don't have our own in, indigenous sources of energy. We've got a lot of nuclear reactors, and they're one by one turning them on again because they have to. They've got no choice, but they're still having to live with that. Could it be next time? I mean, like this is a one, one in a million years event that's happened twice in the last 40 years. <laughs> Now there's this uh, excluding the three mile island. There's this corporation, Global Energy Corporation, which was uh, you know, the, 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 uh, spun out of Spewar, the, yeah. the, the naval research group, that's apparently supposed to be uh, producing a compact reactor uh, under contract to NASA uh, yeah. because a 20 kilowatt thermal reactor that they're producing. You know anything? Have you? Talked yeah. About so that? it's it's fusion fission. It's Larry Paul. So he's a character I like him, um, and <clears throat> uh, basically they are. Uh, fusion and fissioning, and it is what the system can do. But they, they, they've got a different take on how it's actually occurring. So they claim that they're using what amounts to their Lunar research that will produce a neutron source. Which yes. Can then and then that fission, fission yeah. 
the... Uh, it's a compact neutron source, which is controllable, because you can turn on and off the neutrons. So what you do is you have, like, low-grade, non-critical mass uranium or plutonium right. or whatever. It's the leftover stuff. The, the or, waste or just not the overly refined stuff. It's 238. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. You can use, right? and, and so you go along and, and, and you have a device that is able to create a neutron plant. It's like, uh, there's even a company that makes a thing called a Neutrista, which is an electric device which actually shoots out neutrons. Um, so these, th these things exist, but they've, they've got a better way of doing it. Uh, and and uh, they, they shoot the neutrons in. And so it's fusion produces some neutron flux, fission, fusion fission. But actually, Lena itself can fuse, and what it tends to fuse to is lead. It, it hits a brick wall at lead. Why? Because it doesn't like to make anything radioactive and, or, or unstable, and technically bismuth is unstable. So the numbers of experiments that you see lead in uh, is comical. It's basically every time you see a Lena that's d doing any decent amount of heat. And the, why? Because that's the most nucleons you can put into a space-time uh, it, 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 without without making unsta instability, but when you have lead and you have lighter elements, you can actually gain energy by finding tin or antimony in the middle of the table. So by balancing those two out, you actually gain energy. So what you typically find is after lead is synthesised, you then start seeing tin and uh, and uh, zirconium and things like that more, more in the middle of the table or the middle of the middle. To towards the lower end. So the lead splits in half, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it fissions, but it fissions within, uh, in my understanding, within this active agent without being specific. Um, and so, yeah, I, I joked that one, once the, the Indian uh, Suhas Ralkar got his system working, all he needed to do was put more lead in it. <laughs> Just feed it lead, it's cheap as chips. <laughs> and, and you've got to ask yourself, why is there so much lead on Earth? When, you know, the geologists would say, all the heavy stuff sunk to the centre. Well, why is there so much lead everywhere? This is my question about why there are elements. Lead is common in the crust. Wow. What's also common? You've got lead production going on all the time. <laughs> the, uh, one of the other options uh, you mentioned, you've joked about, is um, producing rare elements from, from common elements. Yeah. Uh, so you're, since this transformation can take place, so let's say, let's say I want to start up a shop to do platinum or yeah. tefium or one of those, yeah. uh, one of those materials. Well, you're not going to get much luck. It's going to be harder. So I, I'll say this in my presentation, but maybe I won't now. Um, your nature already tells you what it can do. You've already got four and a bit year, billion years of experimentation going on. So, you know, you look at the periodic table, you look at the abundances, you know how hard things are going to be to make. <laughs> You don't have to ask anyone, you don't have to look at the book, you don't have to do any equations, you just look at the abundance on the crust. Now you know how hard it is to make. So if there's a valuable element, which is in quite high crustal abundance, but it might be in uh, uneconomically extractable quantities. So yes, there's a lot of it in the crust, but you have to mine Nebraska before you get a kit canvas. <laughs> you know, then maybe you, you want to leave it where it is and maybe synthesize it. And so um, one, one of those is scandium. Maybe if you can make scandium, it's not necessarily that rare, but it's only in a few locations around the world. Rare earth elements are not rare, actually. They, they're just people can't be bothered to make them because it was made so cheaply in China. <laughs> and that needs to be fixed. Yeah, um, they're actually very distributed. They're, they're very, very common, yeah. Common, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah. How about lithium? So you can make lithium from hydrogen, you can make lithium from deuterium, uh, uh, and uh, our reaction calculator will show that. And in fact, our reaction calculator will also show you how you can make precious metals as well. And, and in fact, by, by using the reaction calculator previous version, uh, uh, for 50 seconds, I was able to produce that every element on the Royal Society of Chemistry attributed to the alchemists were exactly the elements that preferentially produced gold. <laughs> they are the most energetically favourable. In fact, if you, if you start with bismuth, you, if, if you start with bismuth, mercury, or, or they didn't ha have uh, thallium, and you didn't want thallium, basically, it kills you as soon as it touches the body. <coughs> skin. But um, if you start with bismuth, uh, 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 lead, or mercury, uh, it's basically potassium or calcium. And if you, if you get a Lena process going on, you're going to be making cal calcium from the potassium anyway. So... <laughs> 
the, the top three pretty much in every case uh, energetically favorable and you get back some energy out of it as well uh, uh, is, is exactly what they used it's comical you know they, they used potash and what's potash got in it potassium carbonate which has got the carbon in carbon you need for the linear process it's got bosons it can do the the the, the balancing of the equation so yeah I mean <coughs> we, we can have fun with that if it, you know I, I say what, what is it I think there's um, rhenium I say or uh, ro rhodium is it rhodium I don't know I, 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 in I one, of, one of my yeah. blogs I said it's like it's at like $43,880 at the time of writing per kilo you know and it, it's like you can buy a kilo of uh, 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 bismuth <coughs> it's almost <coughs> pra practically non-toxic uh, and you can buy it for like twenty six dollars, <laughs> so it's worth it for a laugh, <laughs> you know. So if you want to go into rhenium production, <laughs> something to make here, isn't it? <laughs> and there's a guy called Bolotov. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think rhenium is used. That's a, a contact material. I think it's used in connectors for electricity. <coughs> rhodium. Oh, rhodium. Rhodium. Well, yeah. Well, maybe it's rhodium. Anyway, you can look at my blog, but there's a guy called Bo uh, Bolotov in, in Russia, and he's got a, he, he had a pattern, I don't know whether it's expired, but he would take a crucible, and he would put a low melting point metal in there, <laughs> and he would discharge, he would heat it up so it's a liquid, and then he would discharge into it, and you've got lots of excess heat, and uh, you produce a wide range of elements, and some pressures. Um, it, Suhas Ralkar's device it was a... Uh, um, uh, copper sulfate he had an electrode and another electrode he had water streaming over like the Bogdanovich work and he was discharging 2100 volts uh, at ultrasonic frequency with a 200 volt bias so that your evos are all traveling in the same direction <laughs> you've got to have a bias <laughs> between pulses you want them to be drifting uh, not going back into your uh, electrode and, and a lot of successful systems will always have a, a bias voltage to, to, to control your, electromagnetically control them. And you want to make them and break them, you, you, or, or discharge of them. You don't want to let them sit there getting bigger and bigger and bigger until you've lost control. Um, so generating them, moving them from point A to point B to do work, like traveling down a traveling wave tube and generating electricity, uh, and then hitting an end, end point and generating heat or cold. Which is weird, it does that too. <laughs> Why does it make cold? Anyone guess? When it's condensing the matter, it throws out heat. When the structure falls apart, it needs to get the heat back. It's called cold electricity. If you get a, a Tesla arc and you move it to a certain point, you might get ice forming on the anode. It's a little bit weird. <laughs> But that's when you know you're really generating the, the, the right kind of thing. Um, yeah. Is that been observed? Yes. Yeah. Documented? Yeah. yeah. No kidding. I, 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 there's, a, there's, a guy, there's a guy on YouTube that does it. But uh, actually, um, uh, not only did Brian Ahern tell me about his uh, uh, experience with the, the cesium 137, he says, well, the Manelis device is going to be working by Labor Day. He says he's going to have it operating by Labor Day. And by the way, he says, it all works with neutrinos. Neutrino power. <laughs> this guy says that with ultrasound, in fact, not even with ultrasound, at, at five kilohertz, you start to uh, uh, allow electrons to interact with neutrinos. And most of the systems really start to work well at, at, at um, 20 kilohertz and above. And I, I discussed with you last night about how um, sound is extremely important uh, because uh, it, it, in, in, in uh, um, the Amasa gas production unit, the, the vibrator, um, when I went there, he says it's, it's operating at 179 hertz or something. Well, the actual fundamental with the microphone is 176.2. But anyway, the point is, is that I, I thought it couldn't possibly be doing what he's claiming if it's operating at that frequency. There has to be harmonics, there has to be all kinds of things going on in there. And I, I will talk through what I think is really going on in that device uh, and how it's basically the same as Hutchison and, and how you can, you can change elements in someone's body by using infrasound and field interference. And you can do it electromagnetically or you can do it sonically. And I think this is the weapon that they were using in, in uh, 
Cuba. Yeah. Interesting. You, you can do it with electromagnetic waves, ultra low frequency waves, but you, what you do is you just you, you build the field interference so that you're targeting a zone in, in, in somewhere where you want to mess up the people. Um, I mean, it, there, was only, there was only one paper that shoulders self-censored, uh, and it was called disruptor.pdf. And he was saying, sooner or later, these devices will be completely ubiquitous, and, and you can essentially use the power in your lithium battery uh, to create a device that will turn the car's wheels to jelly at a distance, and you won't know who's did it, done it. And that is the real problem with, with the technology, because it, dis it disrupts metal bonds. The reason the metal goes soft and you can put your hands in it is because the lattice gives up its normal <coughs> rigidity. <laughs> um, uh, and it's the same thing Tesla tried to sell to, to uh, Winston Churchill for 33 million a couple of years before he died. Just, yeah, just buy it, we, we can make it, and then anyone flying overhead, their engines will just turn to jelly and it will fall out of the sky. So, you know, the fact that you hear these things and then when you... When you had the well, I, have, I fortunately had the opportunity to see steel turn soft under water. Um, now you could say, oh, it's the leaving frost effect, and it's, it's shielding it, and there's still discharge going in. Maybe, maybe it was that, but uh, um, certainly uh, the Hutchison samples I have. Um, the reason I looked at the one that I'm going to talk about this this evening is because. Uh, I kept asking people, how would you make this? And they would look at it and go, I have no idea. <laughs> because bits of the aluminium have fractured, and they've kind of like moved around and then refused together. So for some reason, they became magnetic, and they aligned themselves with the fields. And then when he turns the fields off, they all stopped, stopped being like jelly, and, and, and re, re, the lattice re, re froze kind of thing. And you'll see it. I might even add it in the bag. Oh, I haven't got it in the back. I've got a piece of that. You, you've got a piece of that, yeah. And it's, it's only this big, but it's like the size of a big splinter, but it's, that's acres on the SEM. We have to kind of wind this up because okay. we have to head off to the uh, uh, geology. Is, is, there, is there questions you have? Like, like Just a real quick one. Yeah. Uh, given, so the, given billions of years of natural production, Yes. Uh, we should expect then a uh, measurable difference between uh, moon rock uh, brought back um, by Apollo astronauts and in terms of, right, we should have measurable differences because on Earth the crust has been subjected to a certain um, effect for billions of years and the moon arguably not. Well, well, we have to go to a crater in the North Pole. So if you subscribe to the Electric Universe theory, then they're saying that the, the, the craters on the moon uh, are actually discharges between the Earth and the moon. They're not large. And this is a, a case for many celestial bodies. As, as the electromagnetic nature of the, the bodies are settling down, there was very large numbers of discharges. Um, and so, uh, so that, that, that's one aspect. So there is an electro, uh, electric strike discharge. But the, the whole point about space mining as, asteroids is the fact that some asteroids have ridiculously different makeups to our Earth. And, if you, if, if, and this is the way I look at it. When we, in Suhas Ralkar's discharge thing, we were finding solid lumps of silver, platinum, gold, palladium. And what it is, is if you get the right resonance, a very large amount of the structure that comes out of the vacuum, or out of this black hole, will be one atom type. Because one came, came into existence, and the rest went <laughs> off, that, off that as the energy condensed. And so uh, it may very well be that, that the, some asteroids were formed in a similar kind of process with EVOs that are the solar scales or or so the system scales and and you know if, if I if I was going to create precious metals with this technology I'd go to a dead bit of space spin it up and then destroy the Evo and I'd go back four billion years later and I'd go and collect my, my, my spoils when everything's settled down <laughs> that would that would be my idea of mining I just need to deal with the death bit <laughs> 
don't think there would be a difference in the environment between the moon? Absolutely. Or obviously, an obviously there is a difference. Asteroid, right? and certainly a they would produce measurable difference. In other words, we have two hunks of rock, one from the moon, one from Mars, one from Venus, say, that would produce measurable uh, difference in the ratio of... Uh, well, it, it, de it depends where you look. I mean, if, if I... Uh, uh, you know, lanthanides. If if I if I go to the middle of Australia, there's a, a huge lump of iron. You know. Yes. It, it, what what what, do you, what what are we comparing it against? Well, you know, you'd have to average your data set over a large number of samples, yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah. And, and that may not not to say it's possible, but you know, when Elon Musk returns a, a representative statistical sample of Mars crust, um, should we expect less lead? I, I would absolutely expect a different proportion of the atoms. Uh, not necessarily a different proportion of the isotopes. So um, uh, the reason I'm saying that is uh, uh, because of gravity. Um, uh, gravity will change the flux of, of red neutrinos in, into that body. Oh, the other thing is, is, and this is a curious thing in this book um, it, about red neutrinos in, in, the, in the growth. He doesn't call them red neutrinos, but anyway. Um, He's talking about the growth of the Earth, that the, the, the lensed flux from the rest of the system goes through this sun and out to Earth, okay, and that that is actually building matter in the Earth's core. And so the Earth is growing, and tectonic plates aren't shifting like under each other. They're, it's, it's like you've got a balloon and you've drawn the, the continents on it, and you're... <laughs> and if you actually look in the geological rep record, if you go back 200 million years, the day was something like 21 uh, uh, hours long. And if you go back 900 million years, it was like 19.1 hours long. I don't know, maybe it's 18.1. So the, Because as, as the Earth has got bigger, because it's absorbed mass from the neutrino flux, uh, it's actually like you're, you, you put your arm out on a, on a, uh, uh, you know, a roundabout at a, uh, at a playground, the, the thing goes slower. You know? So the, the Earth is effectively slowing down. It just We can't perceive it. And in that process, it, 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 the gravity has changed over the uh, course of the Earth. And my, my little takeaway from that is that would explain why the dinosaurs were so big. Because they actually weighed a lot less. They could be big insects, they could be big birds, and they could be really big dinosaurs. Because the Earth was actually, 200 million years ago, it was a lot smaller. And 900 million years, years ago, it was really, really much more smaller. And so we, we, the Earth is gaining mass all the time. And it's neutrinos. It's all neutrinos. Are we done? Five, five up. Any last question? Do you want to know how to make something? I would just like to ask if we could, it's too late to sign up for your pre presentation. Oh, no, it's just open. Anybody can come. I, okay. Sign up is just to sort of get an estimate for how many people all right. can show up. So we can come up. You, you're going to do a little more presentation type stuff? A lot of pictures. I, I, I'm going to mostly... I started off with something I wanted to say, and, and through the course of the week and 140 hours of time in front of the SEM, I realized I don't want to say any of that. I want to say what I want to say. So, because it, it's... Uh, more than... I want to get some uh, uh, really smart minds, which I'm pretty certain there are in this room, to have a look at what I've got to show and tell me it's something else. Tell me I, I saw this on, on the back of my shoe yesterday. What are you talking about, Bob? <laughs> because I, 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 the only explanation I can think of is that it was trying to squeeze it into a small box and, and, and when the thing that was squeezing it into a small box gave up squeezing it into a small box, it came out as something that looked like it had been in a small box. And it wasn't the element that went in. Um, any chance of the any kind of physics process? I doubt it. Hugh, what do you think? Yeah, I have who, tried who, the physics who, department. And I have who's tried. likely to attend? Well, are there any uh, <laughs> physicists uh, who might be there tonight? Um, <clears throat> well, we situated it um, mostly with electrical engineers um, and Earth scientists and, and the, the geologists. Um, Have you told them that they will actually be able to handle Hutchison problems? I mean, from John Hutchison. In, in, with your uh, uh, 
scanning. <coughs> no, I, I, I have a microscope. I have a, a two hundred times microscope. One that you run into. This is the first day of classes. Yeah, and, so, and unfortunately, uh, and since everyone was gone, uh, more like the we started announcing about weeks ago. We're still uh, announcing again today because they're back. But so we don't really have a sense of. Yeah, the other societies that uh, have gone through, uh, there's a, a, re a reimagined nuclear group that has been awarded, where there'll be at least one person there who's been pushing the uh, thorium reactor type stuff. Uh, I know it has gone out to um, uh, the climate lobby group as well, too. You've seen that, too, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, or some people have expressed interest in it uh, as well. On campus, you know, I've, I've tried every, I've tried the, Wisconsin Institute of Energy, I tried the <laughs> physics department, you know, I tried the electrical engineering professors that I know are doing work on fusion and fission. Well, why would they want to come? That's right, why would they want to The job depends on not yeah, knowing. It's not knowing what's going on. Well, <laughs> oh, no, this is, this is an intellectual, it's a fun intellectual exercise to be exposed to. Yeah, I mean, from, from my point of view, I'm, I'm, I'm a curious person. Uh, some people say odd, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> if there's something that I can't explain, I want to I want to have an answer. And, and if all the bright people can't tell me an answer, and I can still see that something weird is going on, I want to know what the what the answer is. And if it's so, it, it, you, you have to travel to other like-minded, curious people. Um, but the implications of this technology are so freaking huge. When you when you ask, I guess I have a question here. Then it's just to raise it. Um, um, Google uh, pursued, I think, some three yeah. avenues. Um, did any of the avenues they pursue touch on what you're? So, 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 so firstly, uh, I worked out that we could have run, run, run the MFMP on its current burn rate for about a hundred years. Uh, uh, no, eight hundred years or something. Yeah, we've we've done we've done eight and a, eight and a bit, one well, seven and a half years for, for about four hundred thousand dollars, and 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 they burned ten million dollars in in uh, four years. <laughs> but Matt Tetherthick is a good guy. I mean, they did reach out to certain members in the community. Okay, my question is, did any of their, their, their I think they really followed three uh, threads. What, what happened? Did they, were, did their, were any of their threads, their editor threads uh, include uh, what you're pursuing? Or, Not at all. So no. they've got, because they have, they've left it over, they're continuing, you know, so, there's, there's more. See, you don't know what they're not telling you. What, what, what was good is that they told enough that was negative enough that Nature would publish them. So that, that at least put the, the, the concept of, that someone is actually caring about this into, into the public consciousness. Like, that, oh yeah, it doesn't work still. Um, <laughs> but what, what disappointed me, and, and, I, and I will reach out to, I will speak to Mark uh, at, at ICCF, is why they uh, didn't look at their ash. Uh, because uh, more often than not, you won't be creating excess heat with this technology. Uh, in fact, it can create a lot of excess cooling. In fact, it can take, create excess heat and excess cooling. As I said, what goes, in, what goes up must come down. So, you know, if you build this structure and then it breaks, it kind of basically gives out and then it wants it all back again. <laughs> well, along that line there, I mean, two groups, the Japanese and in United States of brilliant energy, um, both claim to have success. Is that along the same thread that you're uh, pursuing, or are we uh, are we having the benefit? Is there multiple threads still out there? To get so, so to typically, typically, what happens? Uh, people uh, come up with an idea of how it works. Uh, uh, their investment depends on that and maintaining that position. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that their device doesn't produce excess heat. I do believe believe uh, brilliant energy's device is producing ecstasy because the numbers are plausible. They're easily achievable with this technology uh, without a d d device failing. Um, however, uh, um, you know, and so you said Berlin and who? There's a Japanese. Um, uh, Mizuno. Yeah. M Mizuno is probably the the most experienced. He worked with uh, Amora at, uh, uh, in Sapporo at the university there. And uh, he, he's written the book on transmutation. Uh, the structures and the elements that are synthesized are classical. Um, uh, in, in this field and uh, uh, what he's doing is exactly right now I don't know what, what his logic behind why he's doing it but he's certainly had a lot of experience he's keeping stuff in the solid phase 
Thomas uh, Graham in uh, 1867 defined the maximum amount of, uh, uh, of hydrogen isotope you can store in any element, and that was palladium. And that was all the way back in 1860. The first, first uh, head of the Fellow of the Royal Society, he, he defined that the year before he died. And uh, he, um, he's using that next to nickel. And so you have something that's very good at storing hydrogen and grabbing it out of the environment next to something that really doesn't want hydrogen at all, and it forms like these clusters. And it's the clusters that then, through the anharmonic oscillations and imperfections in the nickel, can be catalyzed into my, my view, right now, I'm subject to change if something better comes along, can form the active agent. And then that can go around, and it will be mostly fissioning the palladium. I think you will find typical uh, elements like silicon, iron, calcium. And uh, at the moment, he's got his mesh from his successful reactor stuck in an XRF device. I want to know if they actually got any data before it got stuck. That's what I want to see. And I suspect it will be the same story. The things that I will show you tonight, unless he's operating in a different universe, and I'm pretty sure he isn't, he will see those things. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Tom, is the address for, Tom, for Helen White Hall? It's Helen White Hall, yeah. And, uh, Where it'd be in the phone book? You, too, you can tell you. Oh, Into Park Street. It's Into yeah. Park Street. Yeah. I'm not familiar. I'm sorry. Before, 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 before you get in the way. I'll just uh, put it in my just phone and check it out. Is, Thank so you so much. Right. North End of Park Street. And North End of Park Street. Just say, how near is this place to the bar? Tom, that's right. It's a place where students drink. Oh, thank you. Um, are you, you going to uh, go with us? Or uh, well, it sounds like we'd be a little crowded in that. Uh, I, I, will, you know, I will back out if you oh, want no, to. Oh, no, no. So you know John better than I do. So. Yeah.